Um, so I'm going to be spinning one of these bowls. It's about six inches across and about four inches tall. And then it's got a nice big rolled edge. Let's see if I can get a good view of it. So there's the, the roll. So this That's is um, my starting thickness of copper is 32 ounce, which is 0.043 thick. And they sell it by the ounce. They don't sell it by the thousands like so many others do, or it's a 19 gauge. So this is what I start with. It's uh, about an eight inch round and it's cut on a circle shear. So I start out cutting it square and then cut it on a circle shear to get this pretty uniform circle. It's almost perfect. So in getting ready for this demo, um, I thought I'd make a new mandrel. So I created this guy, it's solid steel. Do you see it? Is it a good, good location? Um, yeah, um, I can see that. And it's good. really nice, except it, okay. It's really nice, except it showed how out of uh, alignment my lathe is. Because my lathe is probably, it's getting close to 100 years old. And I think the bearings are a little bit shot. And as I ran my first spinning test, you can see I basically started to part it off. And I haven't done this in like 10 years. And I attribute it to it spinning out of round and pushing on this side harder than this side. So it just ripped it. And that is one of the flaws that I used to fight with when I was first learning this. It's a little sketchy. I mean, that's like ready to come off. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I thought I'd share like that, that, that with you. That could be an explosive failure. Yeah, yeah. And I've had some come pretty close to that. So anyway, I thought I'd share that little bit with you. Um, so this is one that I just spun a few minutes ago. And it's annealed and it's ready for uh, to start rolling the edge. So when I put it back on the lathe, I'll uh, trim it again, sand it. Um, so it's a nice finish and I'll go through one start to finish too, but I thought I'd have an extra so I can show two views of running that rolled edge because it's it's an interesting process <laughs> to say the least. So I think I'll start just talking about some of the tools. Um, can you see this guy back here? Yeah, I can. What is that? What is that stick? So this is this, these three are actually called scissor tools. And this would be your trim tool. And it's got a carbide tip on it. Okay. And it's just a lathe tool. I've ground on it heavily um, to get it to work right. Um, so that's, that's what I trim the metal with. And this is um, your eccentric. So it goes this way. This pivots on the, the rest, tool rest. And then the lathe tool, the uh, wheel tool or the cut tool pivots on that. And you'll see when I set it up. And then this is the wheel tool. And it's about three inches with a half inch uh, radius. And it's got bearings in it, tapered roller bearings. Um, this, the leverage that I have with this is enormous. Um, each arm is about four feet long. And when I'm spinning the steel, I'm at the end of the handle, all the way at the end. When I'm spinning the copper, I'm up here because I want very little leverage and pressure because copper moves so easily. Peter, I've got, Billy's wondering what that wheel's made of. Um, I think it's D2. I think. Okay. It's a, it, it's a pretty hard tool steel. Um, it does get scratches, so I have to redress it every once in a while. And I chuck it up on my LeBlanc lathe and uh, use like 320 grit paper on a belt sander. One of those little one inch wide belt sanders mm -hmm. to polish it. And then I, and I is, saw it look like there was some grease up on the back of it. Is that is that just like a standard grease, or what are you using for lubrication there? It's uh, what they. It's actually a saw lube for band saws for cutting metal, 
And it comes from a company called Formax, and it's F-O-U-R-M-A-X. Um, and it's these four Max brothers or Maxwell brothers that started this company. And it's a biodegradable uh, beeswax and um, I forget what else based solid. And it comes in a tube and I'll cut it. And it just used, I use just a cake. Cool. And the mice love it. <laughs> so that's the loop. So these are the, what they call, let's see if you can see these, yeah. These are hand tools. So no compound leverage effect with these. I made this one over 10 years ago. And uh, it's, it's got a radius point. Let's see, get in here. Radius point out here and then a flat. And I use this one. Um, it's really great for doing all kinds of detail work, indents and things like that, because you've got this nice point up here that conforms to a lot of different shapes. And then this flat, and I use this guy to uh, start the round. So if this were on the lathe, I would be pushing out here to start that curve coming back around. So that's what I use that guy for. And then this I bought from Lisa through Pratt. Um, this is a bead tool. So this is just, there's no bearing in here. And it's just a bead piece with a rivet through it. And it just spins. Actually, this one doesn't spin while I'm using it. Sometimes it does, but mostly not. Um, and again, this is what they, just a hand tool. And it's funny thing about these, I, tried to find names for all these tools and they don't name them. They just, they're hand tools or scissor tools. And they talk about the radius on the tip or whatever and that's kind of as far as it goes. And then this is what they call a back stick. And I'll use this so you'll see how I use it. And basically what I do is I come in from this side with the bowl like that and I press here, and what this does is it allows me to flatten any wrinkles out that may be back on this edge. And it does wrinkle. It's just the nature of the piece, especially with copper. So you can see this has done a lot of, lot of work. And, 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 wear out. and, and that, that's just a piece of hardwood? Yeah, this is a piece of white oak. And I keep it nice and long. I mean, it's two and a half feet long. About as long as the hand tool. So that's the, that's the stuff I use. And then we'll move you guys over here a little bit and I'll show you my setup. So here's my annealing station. This is just a fire bricks on a pivot, which is really handy. Found that in an auction years ago. And down here, I've got uh, muriatic acid mixed with water. And it's two gallons of water to one gallon of muriatic acid. And I, made this in 2013 and I've been using it ever since. I haven't added anything to it and I haven't touched it. And what that does, as you know, when you anneal, copper gets real black in the oxide layer, right? So when it's still hot, I throw it in that muriatic acid and it totally blows all that oxide off. And this is how it comes out. Is, is that a pretty like instantaneous thing? It goes in and comes right back out or do you have to let it soak? Nope, just throw it in there and it's, you can just watch it blast the oxide layer off. It's kind of cool. Um, and I'll leave it in for just a second, pull it out. And I've got these tongs that I made a long time ago. Um, they're stainless steel. And that's pretty much what I made them for, is for grabbing this stuff. And then I've got my water bath right here to rinse it off because that um, muriatic acid, it's still strong enough to etch the concrete. Uh, if I put a drop on the concrete. So it's still pretty powerful. And I just rinse it off in there and uh, dry it and we're ready to roll. And then the torch rig and everything. So let me Whoa. reposition you guys. So what I'm thinking is, um, see, can you see me here? I'm thinking I'll do one video shot of um, kind of the overall spinning. And then I'll use this guy to show you more of the detailed, um, how I roll this edge. And I think I have an angle 
that'll look pretty neat, but it's real close up and you don't get to see kind of a real important part of it, which is just the body position while you're actually applying the pressure. Um, so I, I wanna see if I can get both of those used for you guys. So let me get you set up for the initial spinning. That's great. Um, so we got some folks in the chat talking about muriatic acid. Um, that Lisa uses the same stuff for her copper, but at full strength, no heat. Um, and is saying okay. that you know she uses a different one from bronze and for copper because sometimes the bronze will attach to the copper if you use the same for both. Yes. Yep. I actually, for the bronze, um, I just use water. I don't, because I want that oxide layer. I like it. Mm -hmm. So I, I use uh, just water for that and the copper. Yeah, it's nasty stuff. I mean, I, I hope everybody understands how nasty it is. You don't want to breathe the fumes because it does. Uh, steam when you drop stuff in there and uh, you know it's just not good <laughs> gloves and glasses um, yep. I typically don't wear gloves just because it's not that strong and I my hands are going straight into water pretty quickly but uh, definitely glasses because it does um, it does vapor off and I'll uh, when I do the anneal on this one I'll uh, hopefully get you guys down close enough so you can see it so I've got this piece on here already. It takes a few minutes to center it up because you're doing it by hand. I don't have any jigs to uh, make it work. So I thought I'd not waste anybody's time. So here we go. So as it's spinning, I just take this little cake and just apply a little bit, not much. And I don't know if you can see where that wheel is, Nope. Um, not not totally. I mean, the copper is in the way, but I think we'll be able to see what happens when you start doing it. Yeah. So I, on the what they call the follow block, which is what provides the pressure to hold this little wafer of copper. My follow block is wood, and when I go in initially, I like to start the wheel on the wood just to get it spinning, so it doesn't leave skid marks on the piece of work. Um, that's how you scratch the, the wheel and scratch your pieces. Um, so we, we got a couple questions. You you applied that lubricant directly to the copper, right? Not the wheel? Yeah. yeah. Um, you can see then, there is some on the wheel just because it transfers. Uh-huh. Um, you got any sense of what the RPMs you're running for that thing is? I think I'm in low 800. Know, maybe seven something to 800. It's, it's the fastest setting on this leg. Um, so I, I don't really know. And it's, it's actually, it's probably 900 because it's the old motor, probably a 900 RPM motor. And it's got a transmission on it. It's got a four speed transmission. So I can slow it down. And you can probably see it's direct drive. So the belt, the pulleys are identical sizes. So you can see that wobble there. And sometimes the wrinkles get big enough that uh, I gotta use that back stick to pull them out. a little bit further and anneal it. I'm going to do, I usually do these in one anneal, but I'm going to do two before I start the, start the uh, radius with a nice soft copper. So I go back over it real lightly, real slowly, so I don't get any kind of what would be considered fullering. You hear that chatter at the end, that is uh, wrinkled. And let's see if, see if we can see it. 
Can you see these as I turn it? The little oh yeah galloping. So to continue with that, one of these valleys could cause a rip, especially as it gets harder. So what I do is I come in with this guy with my pin here. And I back it up with that. And it's kind of, I don't know if you can see my elbow. So it's, it's, I wish I had three hands. It so looks like three hands would be helpful for this. Yeah, it's, it took me a long time to figure out how to do this. <laughs> so it's kind of loud. Can you hear how it just got quiet? Yeah, is that all the wrinkles smoothing out? Yep. Cool. Um, well, while you're taking this, Anil, um, so Here's we've got a nice. couple of questions for you. So essentially, you are using the wheel to form this to match the mandrel shape, right? It's going all the way down to the mandrel. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And because um, this has, there's so much power in these arms that I can actually form the mandrel too in this wood. Uh -huh. So I can, uh, I have to be really careful not to over push it. So you're using a wood one here, but um, you would, you could use a steel one as well. Yeah. And that new one I made, so I'm, I'm swimming right now and I do that while it's hard so that I don't get any distortion or potential rip. And uh, check it, make sure I'm flat. So the wood I use is uh, Eastern Hard Maple. And that's, I've tried a bunch of different stuff and that tends to be the best, hardest, most stable. I'm just sanding the little burr off. And this is just a preliminary um, resizing or truing up, basically. And you can see it's probably shiny on the video. That tells me I've got it clean and truly round all the way around it. Mm -hmm. So now we'll go to do the anneal. Cool. So that's about how far I went with it. Yeah. Um, well, we got lots of folks who are saying like, that is awesome. And like, whoa, um, Lisa says that looks super fun and insanely satisfying. And I have to agree. Um, um, a couple yeah. of questions. If you have ever hand raised a bowl. Let's see, do I get it? Let's see here. Don't want to move stuff too much or so you can see the stuff see if it's left off um so B billy asks if you ever use those wrinkles that were in there as decoration do you ever leave wrinkles um i haven't i've thought about it but it's not very consistent and you know i've, I've fought so hard when i was learning how to do this to get away from it that I haven't allowed myself to just say, yeah, that's really cool, and leave it. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the old 50s ashtray. Mm -hmm. um, so Tim, Tim Lucas asks, um, do you take a forward stroke and then a back stroke when you spin? I think he's asking if you spin it more than one direction. Yeah, I spin both directions. Because um, what you're doing, you know, we're all metal workers, we understand how metal works and moves. So if I just were to go one way, um, I would stretch it that one direction. So when I come back, I bring a little wave of metal back with me, so I stretch it back, right? So I'm not necessarily elongating the, uh, the piece. Because if I just stretch it one way, it would grow. And it's hard to control that growth. On the way back is a little bit lighter because it'll cut really badly. Okay, so this is getting red. And you don't want to leave muriatic acid in your shop because it'll rust everything. Do 
You can see it's just bam. Um, I would remind everybody now that this uh, bowl he's making here is up for auction. You don't, we've yet to have a opening bid, but $85, you can take this thing home with you. Oh, opening bid, Kirk Fisk, got 100 bucks on that bowl. Right on, thanks Kirk. Lisa, 125. That's what we like to see. I'm going to dry this guy off. So you saw how black it was when it went in. It yeah. Just, I just dropped it in. This is how it comes out. That really just pops that scale right off. Yeah. And again, you know, use all the muriatic acid precautions because this is nasty stuff. And I usually keep it um, out in the shed because I, I used to, when I was in California, I left it in the shop and I was like, why is all my things getting rusty on them just about a foot off the floor? You know, it was just, it just climbed up like the legs of the table. And I read somewhere along the line that if you leave it in your shop, it's going to rust everything. And it does. Okay. Towel's a little wet, so it's not drying up super good. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the lathe and I'll move you guys over there after I get this thing set. All right. Um, and just so you know, Peter, we got some some other familiar faces in the room um, who've shown up a little late, but we got Bart Bart Turner showed up, Joe Elliott. Nice. Claire's Hi. back. Hi, everybody. Kurt Fisk. Cool. Thank you all for uh, joining me this morning. Dave, and Dave, Dave Thompson, I haven't seen him in a while. Um, oh, we got nice. bids for going up. We got 160 for the ball from Lisa. Awesome. Okay, so here we go. Um, and so real quick, I would just remind the folks who are in the chat, I see both Bart and Kurt are writing, but they are writing to just panelists. You need to change that on the blue button from all panelists to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see Kurt's new bid at $200. Wow. <laughs> okay. So you, I don't know if you can hear that banging or that vibration. Yeah, that's, that's my bearing. That's my bearing. They're, they're tight. So after this demo, I think I'm going to pull this guy apart and rebuild it. New bearing, try to screw everything up. Hasn't been done since I've owned it. So I take one sort of resizing to the mandrel path because it never goes back in the same place. So very slowly. So now I'm out on that edge. And copper is such a great material to spin. It's what I learned on. And the thing that makes it so great is it's so soft. It's just so yielding to the tool. So I'm going to stop there and true it up again. You can see I'll stop it and you can see how it's gone out around. And that's just the way it is. So I'm going to use the back stick and take these wrinkles out and then true it up again. Okay. I love doing that. Like yeah, all that so, nasty just goes away. Well, it's pretty crazy to listen to and to hear all the chatter just disappear so quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's really something when you have it in steel because of how strong the steel is. 
Um, That's so when you're doing damage. a steel one, are you are you annealing the steel in a similar fashion, or is it just a straight start to finish job? Straight start to finish. It depends on how big and what kind of steel. Um, for my pans, it's a one shot deal because I use a pretty malleable grade of uh, of steel. Um. Peter, Lisa asks, if you're doing production on these things, you kind of get into like the meditation mode. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I was a little worried and I'm still a little worried because doing the, uh, the rolling, um, it's, I haven't done a whole lot of it and it's super intense. You've got to be so focused. So when I'm doing this, um, I'll ask you not to talk in my ear. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to go one more anneal, and this is pretty well ready to roll. I'll do another anneal, put it on the lathe, and just take the tool over it gently to resize it to the mandrel. And then uh, I may work it down just a little bit smaller, and then go ahead and uh, start rolling it. You guys will want to watch this or just leave you where you are? Um. I mean, I don't know if you want to take the time. We always like to see see what's going on. Um, okay, yeah. It is a demo for crying out loud. It is a demo. Um, and then when you think you roll that edge, are you going to keep the camera where it's at or are you going to give us a close up? I'm going to do both. Oh, great. So I'm going to, I've got another one ready. So I'm going to do one where the camera, where it is. So you can kind of see just body position and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll do another one where I hope you can um, see tool position on the edge. Because it is, it's totally finesse work. Too much pressure, it'll collapse, not enough, you'll work hard in it too fast. Um, there's there's a, so many things that can go wrong. <laughs> So Billy asks about how many bowls do you get out of one of those wood mandrels? Uh, beyond counting. I have no idea how many that's made. Many. It's, it's over a hundred. And then when are you at that, that point scrapping the bowl or are you just modifying it to a, to a new shape? Um, I can modify it to a new shape. I have screwed that one up a little bit. Um, it gets rolled in it, you know, just kind of wavy circles. And I'll take, uh, put it on my wood leg and uh, use kind of a flat cutter to flatten those things out. And then sand it up again. That's why I did the metal one, the steel one. Um, because I want to, I want to start doing these bowls as a production. Because I really like them. And the, the few I did a month ago were really well received, and they're fun to do. It's great practice. Um, so Phil, Phil Stringer is asking if um, sulfuric acid could be used instead of muriatic. Do you have any experience with that? I've not used it. I think it can. It's not as easy to get as muriatic. You know, this is just swimming pool acid. And it's like nine bucks a gallon or something like that. It went up recently, kind of surprised me. But you can get it at any hardware store. So it's super easy to come by. Is uh, sulfuric acid in batteries? Oh, I'm not sure. Anybody in, yeah, the, okay. anybody in the audience know what sulfuric acid main purpose is? <laughs> Well, there it is. Comes out nice and clean. Um, Peter, are you are you cutting those copper blanks out yourself, or are you ordering them as rounds? No, I have a circle shear, and I buy all of my material in full sheets. And I've got a straight line shear 
that I cut into everything into squares. And then uh, circle shear, uh, I cut all the circles. So for all the different pans and bowls and various shapes that I do, um, I cut all that stuff. One of the things I wanted to touch on, speaking of cutting, is um, getting the sizes for these. And there's a, it's a real guesswork because it's really hard to measure um, the, the size, well, let's do it here, the size here accurately. We can't, we can't see it, you're not in the screen. What are you oh, showing okay. us? Oh, there you go. Hey, there you go. Yeah, so when you try to figure out the size of your blank, and what I mean by blank is this guy. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a basic formula that kind of gets you close, and then it's trial and error. And that's, that's just the way you have to do it. And the formula, if anybody's interested, is length, plus radius, and when they say length, they're talking about this right here, from there to here, so the length of the rise, and the radius would be your outer diameter, you know, half your outer diameter, and then you multiply that times 0.8, and that kind of gives you a starting point, and then you adjust accordingly, depending on metal thickness, depending on overall height that you want, how accurate your tolerances need to be. Um, that's all part of it. And one of the things with the spinning is um, you do stretch the material a little bit. You know, the, the more you do it, the better you get at it, the less you stretch it, but it all grows just a touch. We'll move you guys back over here. Um, and having been in your shop, I know sometimes you have to shuffle tools around to use them, but Hunter's wondering if before this is all said and done, if we can do a little circle shear demo. Um, I don't have it in the shop anymore. Oh. I built a new building out back and I moved it over there. And it's, I've got all the sheet goods in there now and uh, all my spinning blanks are out there and all that. Well, congratulations on the new square footage. Yeah, it's not much. It's only like 200 square feet, but hey, you know, every, every inch helps. <laughs> sure does. Okay, so we are back in business there. Um, Bart's asking if you do the acid quench every time you anneal, or can you get away with just doing it at the end? Um, you can do it at the end. I want to cool it off anyway. I don't want to just let it sit. And I found that if you build up that... Um, Oxide, it just gets harder to get off because it just gets thicker and thicker. So I, I try to find the, the mating surface. So I just kind of spin a little bit. There it is. It's not exact, you know, the, with the annealing process, it does uh, distort the surface. So then more, more wax on it. Not much. You can see I'm going over it pretty quickly. Um, do, does the copper scale affect the surface like the same way that forge scale does, where it would leave little no. pits or anything? Not on a microscopic level, yeah. But on a just visual level, no. And part of that, I think, is it doesn't grow as fast as carbon scale. I don't know if you can see how this thing is wobbling until I get to the end. Yeah, you can see it moving a little bit. Okay. And so then when you get to yeah, rolling this edge, that, that's when you want me to shut up, right? You got to concentrate? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, the first one I did came out flawless, and then I came out here one morning after having a couple of cups of very strong coffee, and I just totally blew it. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> got to pay attention. Got to be on point. So I used my fingernail up against that edge, 
to see if I got it um, concentric. And I'm sure some of you are like, oh, don't do that. Your finger won't, your fingernail won't cut because I've trimmed everything away. And I go right on the flat of the cut so there's no barbs or you know, rag to catch me. Now we're turning it up real nice because this is going to be that inside finished bit of the look. Yes, yeah, so you got to get it finished all the way right now. Yeah. And I tried, you know, in my process, I'm self taught with this stuff. I mean, there's not many people doing this kind of work anymore. Um, I had a ton of failures, and I finally figured out that this has to be absolutely perfect. Otherwise, it causes uh, uneven stretches, and that'll turn into fat. Just um, having a rag, a little bit of a rag on here, you start a fissure point. It's like a cold shot. What what exactly are you using to clean that right now? It's a, a 100 grit sandpaper. Is okay. That? Yeah, you just have it folded up. Yeah, this is really great paper. Super, super aggressive, really strong, holds up well. And I use it for the finishing on all the bowls or pans too. Okay, let me just roll that down just a little bit more. So there's no way to measure this radius or how much material I need. So it's really done by eye. How far up the circle I come. And I go just to where it uh, goes to flat. I'm going to put some lubricant on the inside. So I'm rolling it back on itself and curling it over. Am I in front of the camera? If I get yep. <laughs> This is a very, um, and that's where you can work hard. I've got a little bit big of the roll going. So I'm not going to pull it off of there because I want to sand it. But you can see, pretty good. Look at that little old, no wrinkles. Can I, can, I, can I talk to you again? We got questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to do some sanding here real quick. Great. Um, okay, so kind of the immediate one here. Um, Gr Greg Sawyer asks, or kind of, that it looks like you're using the flat of the tool and then twisting the handle as you get the roll like you're coming at it and then you're 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 actually spinning the tool while it rolls is that or are we seeing that right yep yep yes you are so i, I am using the flat and you know the flat will only do so much so you have to change its position to get that roll to grow and as i do that yeah, just roll it around that edge. It's kind of a rough um, 
rough forming. Just so that I can start with the, uh, the roller tool, the beading tool, to uh, finish it out. And that actually is what gives it its uh, consist consistent size, is using that bead. I could hand roll kind of anything. But now I'm sanding. Pretty good. I'm going to bring you a little closer so you can see what's going on here. Thank you. Um, the, the tool you were using for putting that bead on there, um, is it, does it have a concave surface to it? Yes, it does. Yep. So it is the radius, mm -hmm. right? And basically I start a little bit of a curve and then I finish it out with this because this is what gives it the consistency. So you can't really see it. I'm trying to stay on a tripod and not do a shaky pixelated picture here. Well, thank you. Yeah, I learned from the last one. <laughs> yeah, maybe if I turn this light off, it'll be a little better. Yeah, we can see that pretty good. Okay. Um, so you can sort of see there's little grooves in here from the spin tools. So because I want to do a really nice uh, mirror finish on here, I want to sand those little grooves out. So I'm using that 100 grit paper again. It's lightning. It takes the high edges off. And I'm spinning it the other way so it drives the dust back away from me instead of out. Then I'll come in with these uh, 220. And this is a great paper for this stuff too. Yeah. want to sand it enough to get the scratches from the heavy paper out and that's part of the reason why I don't go super far with that heavy paper because it does cut really quickly. Um, so well, you're, you're getting comments that um, you're making this look super easy, Peter, that other folks have, have tried lathe spinning. Brian says he's, he's tried this before and you're, you're making it look super easy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it wasn't that easy to get here. So I scratched the bottom. So when I put my tarch mark on there, I have a place to reference from off that point. So there it is. And just so people know, I generated, it's in the hundreds of pounds of scrap learning how to do this. I mean, mm -hmm. it took me a year of failures before I started getting any successes, but I was like, I've got to figure this out. It's so cool and so fun um, that I, I had to, I just stuck with it. Can, can you uh, give us kind of a close up of the backside of that, that rollover? We're That's real nice work, man. Beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, I love these. I love the look of these. You know, I thank Lisa for bringing that uh, wheel tool or bead tool to the conference or Swaptoberfest or whatever it was. Because this is just, I've had a, I built a smaller one. It's an eighth inch. But this just, it fits really nice. I just really like it. So that's that guy. Now I'm going to take this other one. So we get, a, we get a double dose so you guys can really see um, mm -hmm. how this happens. And I can't leave the camera there because I'll just knock it over. 
Yeah. I think right here. Um, I thought about is this trying a, to pitch. Go, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. You're you're, uh, you're in charge. Okay. <laughs> I thought about giving you a view from up here where the tool actually is, but it, it didn't work out so well. I was actually using the magnetic base on the end of my, uh, this tool rest and it vibrated off. Okay. <laughs> um, is this a particular grade or alloy of copper that you're using? Yeah, it's a, a C110. And I buy it at, it's oxygen free, which most of it is. It's an electrical grade. And what that oxygen means, oxygen free designation means is there's no uh, pores in the, in the copper. There's no, because oxygenized copper will have little pinholes in it. And that causes all kinds of problems. Um, so they want it to be absolutely as pure through the thickness as they can get. So that's why they call it oxygen free. And it comes to me, I believe, as a half hard alloy. And I, I believe it's 99.9 .9 pure. Um, did, where, where are you ordering that from? I get it from Alaska Copper in Portland. And they're real funny to deal with. If you don't speak their language, they are phone deaf. When I started making my uh, copper band, copper pans, custom pans, I was having it sent up from uh, Sequoia Copper and Brass out of uh, San Leandro down in the Bay Area, California. And, uh, you know, there I'd tell them I want 093 thickness. And they'd be like, great, no problem. We'll cut it and ship it to you. And I'd go to Alaska and I'd say, hey, do you guys stock 093? And they're like, no, nah, we just stock, you know, regular copper gauges or, uh, you know, we sell it by the ounce or whatever. Finally, one day I was in there and the uh, receptionist was real chatty. So I started talking to her about it. She's like, oh, yeah, you mean 72 ounce? We've got tons of that stuff. Yeah, we'll sell a little sheet of that. And that was after like three or four orders. Yeah, you got to figure out how to speak the same language, that's for sure. Yeah. So I'm going along this one again real slow to get the size. And I don't know if you can see that wave. Yeah. So that is now size to the man girl. And I am the pressure is basically my arm weight. So I'm not pushing on this hard. I'm going just to the point where I feel resistance and that's it. I find these carbide cutters are the most versatile. Did you say car carbide cover? cutters are yeah for this stuff because i you know i beat on them and i've probably in the last five six years um only gone through like two of them i regrind them all the time too well this camera view is great peter Good. How are we doing on time? Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, Love that it's answer. Real interesting. You just keep going as long as you need. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the dilemma of the blacksmith, right? Time? <laughs> I'm having fun. Yeah. Okay, Only so one more the, heat here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the proverbial one more heat. So I'm basically, if you were to draw a straight line out of the center of the mandrel, that's where the point of this is. 
So I'm not riding up on it and I'm not dragging behind it. I want to be right at that center point because then I can see it. Now I'm rolling the tool. Ambidextrous, which are, and come back in. This is the scary part because it can collapse and cause irreparable damage. <laughs> And I turn this wheel too. I turn them both. You know, just like any tool, you want it to do what you want it to do the way you want it done. So you, you do what you have to with it. I don't know if you're able to see the the motion or how things are changing. Yeah, this is really cool to watch. Great view. Okay. Well, you ready for some questions? We got some. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and sand it, but I can uh, listen and answer. Okay. In no particular order. Um, uh -huh. So what's, what's the reason that you're coming at the ball at that low angle rather than straight on at 90? In the, uh, the previous view I showed, did you actually see where the tool was in relation to me? Um, it, it was kind of hard did, to tell from the view. That? No. Um, okay, I was hoping that would be part of it. So I have, let's see, let me just rearrange it here. I don't know if this is going to give it, show it or not. You're a little high, I think, on the camera. Yeah, let me, let me back you up a little bit because I want to show you how I'm holding this. So I take this and I put it in my armpit and I'm using this as a fulcrum point mm -hmm. and it's, you're much more stable using your leg to adjust than trying to muscle it because your body weight is so much heavier and it gives you a lot more control. And then with this guy here, so it's a real natural position, right? And I'd raise and lower this depending on where I want to hit that uh, center point. Uh, does that make sense? Sure does. Okay. Okay, so um, next question. Um, when, that, when you're rolling that lip, um, it didn't look like it on the last one, but are you rolling it all the way back on itself to make like, a, is it like essentially making a tube or are you always holding it shy? I hold it shy. And the reason I do that is I feel with uh, something that's going to hold food, you want to be able to get in there and clean. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to fill it with uh, tin or anything like that. Um, and then B Billy asks if you ever um, tool or chisel grooves or anything or other decorations onto the surface of these, or are you just always going for clean? At this point, um, no, I just started making these copper bowls again. I had made one in a bunch of years since I've been out here in the day. And I probably will start doing grooving on it. I thought about making um, kind of these 
these type of wheel tools with a filed wavy pattern on it or something like that, and just giving it one of these things to give it a just a quick uh, patterning. Um, so there's there's room to play in there. Well, I'm excited to see when you do some playing and see what you come up with. Um, so B Bart Bart wants to know if you can spin bronze the same way as you're spinning this copper. Yes, I have not spun it. Um, I've got a sheet of eight inch, uh, uh, like a two foot by one foot sheet, and I've been too chicken. It was like two hundred dollars or some crazy number in the box, and I've been too chicken to to spin it. <laughs> but well, I'm gonna. I think that's an understandable fear. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> um, um, when you're when you're spinning copper pans, mm -hmm. um, what's what what size stock are you using for the 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 pans? Like thickness wise, is it the same material? No, it's uh, a point oh, it's a point nine three. 093. It's just under um, an eighth of an inch. Okay. So, or what? It's 72 <laughs> ounces if you go by the Alaskan copper. Um, and so now I think what the fun question Joe asks what the most dramatic failure you've had? Um, <laughs> that is a good one. You want to reenact this one so, for us? <laughs> I don't, I don't have a big enough piece of copper or mandrel. <laughs> so some of you who cook and make preserves know that copper is like the preferred thing to mix your jams and jellies in, right? And um, I'm gonna set you guys up. I'm gonna do the touch mark on this to show you how I do this. So I get it nice and consistent. Um, so this was, I don't even know how many years ago down in California, um, guy asked me if I could do, it was like a five gallon pan to uh, mix uh, jams and jellies in. And he wanted it out of, it might have been eighth inch. It was really big. It was 24 inches across. It was too big to go on my lathe. I had to put booster blocks underneath it. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the bed, it's just a flat bed and then the uh, live head and dead head ride in a, in a track just like any other lathe. So you can build it up. You can put, I put two inch blocks underneath it so that I could get this whole setup in there. So it's much taller. I've got a really thick piece of copper that's 30 inches in diameter and I've got to raise it it was probably 10 inches and I wasn't that experienced yet. And as I'm raising it, um, spinning it, it's growing and it continues to grow and it's growing. And so finally it was like, I got to cut some of it away. So I took that cutting tool and rather than going from the edge all the way in, I started about an inch in and I was going to part it off and I did it um, soft because I thought that was the way to do it back then. And I got about halfway through half of it and it came unglued. So I had this flap one inch wide, about about oh, three thirty seconds thick and about, it was probably two feet long, just flapping on the lathe as it was going around because it just like broke. And the switch was on the other side on the lathe from where I was standing of that flap. So I had to walk all the way around my shop to turn it off. <laughs> um, that sounds terrifying, Peter. <laughs> it, was, it was, yeah, I was like, oh God, <laughs> this is where I die. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you're still with us um, with more knowledge under your belt. Yeah, a few more, um, not as many dramatic failures, but definitely some failures. Um, so, got a question for you, because I guess we didn't recognize, oh, touch mark, here it comes.
Yep. Um, we didn't re realize you were going to have two bowls you were making. Mm -hmm. um, and so are these both up for auction? Can we auction both these off? Um. I think so. Why not? For oh. a good cause, good group well, of people. Well, thank you so much. Um, okay, okay, so... So for the folks in <laughs> for the folks in the room who are bidding, um, I'm not totally sure where we're at. I know that um, Kurt has put two hundred dollars down for this. Um, it's got a match or seed though. You can't have Kurt paying more than you than you I'm sorry, we couldn't hear you. Oh, hang on, just that. I can get the angle right. Oh, there it came in. It came right. into focus. Yeah. Tripod is definitely a better way to go. So that failure, this is kind of what it looked like flapping. So this Except is split like right here. Giant. <laughs> way bigger. Yeah. So that's like worse than the meat saw at the butcher. <laughs> um uh billy asked if that's an approved use of that swage block you've got just sitting there buried in tools um <laughs> it is approved i approve it wholeheartedly it's uh it's a spacer all that pile is spacers and i regret to say that i very seldom use that swage block hmm. Well, if you just need a big piece of steel as a spacer, I might be able to trade you. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Billy's offering the same thing. He said he'd make a custom spacer for you. Nice. You guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Phil uh, is asking again, the, for the slow RPM on your lathe, that was about, mm -hmm. you thought it was like 800, 900, somewhere in there? Uh, seven to eight. Well, maybe I yeah, know rethinking because I think the motor is a 900 RPM motor. So yeah, I'm thinking it's somewhere right around 900. Oh, great. Okay. So we got Kurt's at $200 for one of them and Silas just bid $200 for the other one. So, um, nice. Thank you, thank guys. You, thank you all for your generosity, Silas, Kurt, and Peter, and you know anybody else who wants to outbid these fellas, sure could try. Oops, technical difficulties here. Hang on, fellas. There we go. There he is. Okay. Hey, welcome back, Peter. I don't know what I did, but it just went dead. <laughs> That's okay. We had some things we talked about. Um, nice. Yeah, membership drive. Get people to renew. Yeah, well, that's kind of part of it. Um, uh, oh, and so Patricia brings up a good point that your the 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 uh, hot iron news that you get will on the label will have the month of your expiration on there for folks that can see that. Um, and uh, Peter, any auction item that raises over two hundred and fifty dollars um, gets free membership. And Dahlberg just bid 250 on one of those pans. So congratulations, sir. Your generosity just got you a free membership for a year. Um, How nice is that? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. OK, I'm going to go grab another bowl and uh, so I can show you the cleaning process Oops. without knocking anything over. Still there? Still yep. there. Okay, so these are the ones that I just found. So I don't know if anybody's familiar uh, with doing tinning. Um, again, it's another one of those self taught deals. Uh, really hard to find information on it. Um, I talked to these people um, extensively. And that's how I ended up with this material. And it's a um, zinc oxide, zinc chloride flux with ground up tin suspended in it. So you just brush it on. It's actually totally cheating, but it's really easy. So 
with the tinning, you've got to have it virgin copper. So it's got to be this clean with no smudge marks or anything on the inside. <clears throat> and what I've found to be the best to do that is one of these nylon grit impregnated bristle wheels. It just gets right to it. Um, so I went ahead and cleaned one up last night in preparation and painted in the tin. And that's kind of how it goes in. So if you guys want, you can watch me do the cleaning or we can just go ahead and do the tin melting with this guy. Um, well, I mean, if the cleaning's not too long, I'd say just take us through the process. Okay. Silas, yeah, Silas I'll do that. like to see the cleaning. So. Okay. Yeah, it really doesn't take that long at all. This, this thing just rips through it. And I got this as like the ACE hardware. <laughs> I was kind of dubious about it, but I've used it a lot and it's maintained its shape. It hasn't lost any bristles and it cuts really nice. So yeah, it's kind of, there's a good view. So I go through and I just get this first. The other nice thing about this is it gets into the corners nicely. Um, when you have been done, done if we could just make sure to, um, we'd love to see that tin flux again. And Joe, Joe's wondering where to get it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will show that again. Um, so I've done a lot of copper pipe work. And anybody who's ever done any copper pipe work knows how important it is to get this stuff clean. Like nothing on it, no oil particles, no oxide layer, nothing. You know, this I was reading about this flux last night, um, and they say that it'll remove a certain amount of oxide, but I just I get real fastidious on this. It's got to be just sanitary because I've had so many failures in pipe by not taking the time. I'm gonna come back around. I try to get a nice line across the top because that's what's going to allow the pin to stick or not stick. And it's going to keep the, the transition between the two really nice. Um, Pete, Peter, um, we were catching most of what you were saying, but I think that with being so close to that tool, it's kind of drowning you out a little bit. Oh, OK. Yeah, what I was saying is I try to get a really nice line around here because the tin is going to stick to where it's really clean and it's not going to stick to where it's dirty as well. And even just this, even though I sanded this, um, that little bit of oxide that's grown on there just in this amount of time and me touching it is going to hinder the uh, tin. So you kind of leave like a dirty line to keep it so it has a, a good end point. Mm hmm Yeah, that's the intention. I'll do the other one off offline unless you guys want to ride along. Um, I bet you we could just watch the one. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So there it is. Nice and clean. So now I use um, just one of those cheap disposable natural bristle brushes. This one's done quite a bit of tinning over its life. And I used to dilute this stuff down, like I'd, I'd wash the bowl out with water and leave the water droplets in it. <coughs> and uh, I found that it caused problems with the tin, tin. So I use it full strength now. I don't dilute it at all. And I want to get a nice even coating in there. And I brush out the same way I did with the cleaning tool to try to get a nice clean line along that outer lip. P 
Peter, can you tell us the purpose of the tinning? Yeah. So, like I said when I was talking about my enormous failure, um, copper reacts with foods, different types of foods differently. In some cases, you want that reaction in the case of jams and preserves and egg whites, and I think that's really it. Um, so if you were going to have, say, a bowl of spaghetti out of this, it would adversely affect the flavor of the spaghetti sauce. It would be like kind of gross. So you put tin in there so that um, it doesn't react with the food. And the tinning has been um, done for probably hundreds of years. Um, it, Lisa's wondering how thick or thin that tinning is. Um, it's very thin. It's the, the granules are super fine. Uh, and I try to put it on so that I'm just coating it. I'm not trying to leave any puddles or get a big buildup. So I'm, I'm kind of putting it on as thin as I can. Mm -hmm. And then I go around the outside kind of wipe that line down. And you gotta be really careful um, when you wipe it off. You don't wanna touch it with stuff on your fingers because you're gonna leave it there and the potential for it to stick is high, <laughs> higher than I'd like. So that, so that the tinning agent you're using, I mean, it, it comes pre-mixed, it's, it's wet. It's not a dry, dry flux at all. Right, yeah, it's ready to go out of the bottle. And I'll show you that where, stuff again. Um, where where did you get, are you ordering it online? Yeah, I bought it directly from Johnson and I'll show you. All right, take a screenshot, Joe, here's your chance. Yep, and if he gets in touch with me, I'll send him the link to it. Um, and it's, it's Johnson, tins and fluxes or something solders. They make a lot of this stuff and they make it for the automotive industry. And um, yeah, you can, I think there's other retailers you can get it from, but I went to the source because I wanted to talk to them directly about how to do it, you know, kind of the procedural aspect and really easy to deal with. You know, again, I'm a small consumer of this stuff, but they spent a lot of time talking to me on the phone about it and gave me all the great information. Um, so B Billy, Billy asks um, if you've already, if you've finished the tinning process and that line isn't as straight or as nice as you want it, can you go in there and sand the tin off mm -hmm. to reestablish a sharp line? Yes, you can definitely do that. Um, but it's just the problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, work, yeah right? but better to hit it the first time. Yeah, exactly. So Joe I don't know. Info. <laughs> What's that? Joe, thanks you for the info. Oh, you're welcome, Joe. So because this is a bowl and it's going to be pretty, you know, 450 or 500 degrees, I made this handle to hold it. So I can turn it over and not drop it and have a way to actually hang on to it while it's really hot. And I'm super high tech. I use zip ties to hold the, the ends together. <laughs> Plastics, way and, to the future. Uh, so this one, totally. <laughs> so this one I did last night and I'll go ahead and do it. I'll probably do both of them because I've got this other one ready to go. So this is, um, a burner out of one of those like camp chef or whatever outdoor chicken roaster things. Um, just wanted something easy, came with the regulator and everything. And it was probably like $17, $20 something. It wasn't very much. And it's got an adjustable regulator on it. So that's about how hot, I'm not going full full steam, that's a little hot. 
Somewhere right in there. Yeah. I'm gonna open the door here so I get some fresh air. Yeah, is there much, um, are you worried about, you know, off-gassing of that tin? I mean, is it, is it a pretty toxic thing? It's, um, it's toxic enough. I mean, if I were, I'll do this round without a mask on, but typically I put a, um, an organic vapor, organic chemical mask. I'll show you which one I need. I have it up here in a bag. But I've got a door right behind me. This is what I use for the mask. See if I can find your number. Yeah, it does it. You know, if you can smell it, as I say, if you can smell it, you're not blocking it out. And I can't smell it through this mask. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a question. If you so, if you um, had kind of painted that the the tinning flux on the one from last night. And then the one you mm -hmm. did right now, I mean, I'm assuming the one from last night has dried. And then well, I, something, I, something I learned last night, you know, doing prep for answering questions, the zinc chloride is hydroscopic, super, super hydroscopic. And I know that by this is the zinc oxide and you can't really see it. You can kind of see the shiny. Yeah, what is that in your hand? What are you holding? This is bat insulation. Okay. And this brown is that zinc oxide or zinc chloride flux, and it's wet. So it attracts water. So I thought this would be dry when I came out this morning, and it's not. Oh, it's still wet, huh? It's still wet, yeah. So when you do this, and I should tell you guys, I use uh, just regular old bat insulation, take the paper off, and this is what I wipe it with. And the reason, that it used to be done with uh, pure cotton, cotton batting or whatever, and copper, so many things that are protein-based flash at 450 degrees, and that's essentially the temperature of the tin, and this insulation doesn't flash at 450. So you can get in there and work it and not worry about it catching on fire. And it leaves a really nice finish because it's so fine in how, you know, it's, it's not very coarse. It's a very soft material, kind of cotton-like. And um, the other thing is you want to start, like this did like four bowls. This did probably another four bowls, and they're done. This part of it's done. So I'll be working on with this side because you want to start with it clean. It leaves a cleaner um, finish in the end. Um, so I I think Lisa is mildly appalled that you are um, holding fiberglass with your bare hand. Is there is there any other way? She says because she um, admits to not ever wanting to touch or breathe insulation. <laughs> 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 um, having come from the construction background, I'm so familiar with this stuff. And as long as you're not like driving it between your fingers and all that stuff, I'm not going to have any splinters in my fingers. If I was doing a lot of work with it, like when I do um, a run of tinning, I put on those. Uh, These guys, I don't mean to be, just these rubber gloves, that's yeah. all it takes. Yeah. And as long as you're not flapping it around and throwing it and kicking it, uh, the fibers are a minimum of exposure. Mm -hmm. so, and, if, and then if in you're doing a run too, you've also got your respirator on and you're not breathing that. Exactly, yeah. But I, yeah, I agree, I don't like fiberglass. I, if there was anything else I could use, I would, but this is, um, all of the countless hours of YouTube video that I've watched watching people do this and trying to figure out how they've done it. This is the one thing that everybody kind of unites around as being the best um, for doing this because it doesn't burn. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and start. And I kind of, I want to heat it gently 
and bring it up as evenly as I can because the whole surface has to be melted. I can't have one spot melted and the other not because it won't flow. I'll hit that one spot that's not melted and it'll drag and leave a really rough surface. And you just take your time. And I hope you guys can see this when it actually flashes, because there it goes. You see that? Oh, it's kind of changing sheen. Yep. So that's flashed. It has melted. And I continue to roll it around. Billy asks if you think you could do this in an electric kiln. Um, no. Did you see that? Was I on camera for that? Um, you're like half on camera for the white. Okay. So you usually want to have a receptacle to catch the particles that you're wiping out, but I don't. I forgot to set it up. A little bit of drip. Let's see, I want to get my drip pan here. I'm just dumping it on the floor. Um, so you're, you're wiping out the liquid tin that kind of has pooled in there, correct? Yep. So, you, so you're all the way off camera now. I don't know what you're doing, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm continuing to wipe it. Okay. Sorry about the flash there. Yeah. So there it is. That's, that's done. And I'll go down and uh, wash it in the bucket. And you'll see, you know, you can see this kind of dirty, not super shiny, and it'll, it'll come up quite clean. So I'll be back in a sec. Um, so, you know, the tin coating you put on there, Nuke asks if, if it'll ever flake away, if you're like using a whisk, or something to like whip things up in a bowl. Will it chip and flake? It won't flake, but tin is very soft, so it'll wear. So what I've done, it's, it's actually kind of cool. You know, bronze is basically an alloy of tin and copper, right? And maybe some other stuff, depending on what kind of bronze it is. Um, and that's the difference between bronze and brass. Brass is uh, copper and zinc. So what I've basically done is I've made the tin liquid and there's a microscopic bond in there that is actually bronze because the two materials have opened up to each other. So it's, it's beyond a mechanical bond. It's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. They're holding on to each other. What was funny? Oh, just um, I have never um, considered uh, the symbiotic relationship with metals in a bowl before. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. And I didn't get it hot enough to um, do a lot of oxidation, but a little bit. So Lee, Lee, Lee says that that's called diffusion bonding. We put it in parentheses. <laughs> Okay, nice. I knew somebody would know it. So um, I got a little bit of a spill. Okay. You can see that maybe? Yep, that little lump of there. Right there, yeah. So I'll sand that off. But other than that, it looks pretty darn good. There's another little bit. It's really easy to get this stuff kind of all over the place. They make another product that I use when I'm doing runs. This stuff right here. What and I mix calcium carbonate limestone yep. pH neutralizer. 
Yep, and this is garden quality. It's really, really fine. And they use this for changing the, the pH in soils. But you mix this with water and then you paint it on the outside. And what it does is it becomes a release agent for the tin. It won't stick to it. And it oh. also slows down the oxidation just a little bit. Uh, I decided not to do that because you need to let it dry. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for not having us watch um, resist dry. Um, yeah. Paint um, dry. So <laughs> si Silas asks if you know um, if you were going to retin something, is it necessary mm -hmm. to clean out all of the old tin? No. The only time I do that is if I don't know what that tin is, because some of uh, the older ones have a little bit of lead in there to make it flow better. So we'll go through and do one more, how about? Perfect. Um, so way earlier in this demo, um, I think you were rolling the bead. We had some questions about your lathe, and I don't know if now's a huh? good time to ask. Um, sure, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, tell us about that thing. Is it is it like purely a spinning lathe? How old is it? What kind of model? I mean, it is purely a spinning lathe. Make sure I get out this. Um, it came from. Oops, I don't have it. Seems as though I bent my little leg right here. So I think I'll forego this one. Okay. Well, you knew somebody who could fix that for you. Yeah. You want to come up and uh, give me a hand? Yeah, I'll be right there. It'll <laughs> take me about six hours. Okay, cool. <laughs> so spinning lathe. Let's just head back over there and hopefully I don't disconnect myself again. So this is what they call a purpose-built lathe. It came out of the aerospace industry in Southern California. I found it on Craigslist. And uh, I've been looking for probably a year. Hadn't found any anywhere. And this showed up. I called the guy within an hour of him posting it. And I said, I'll take it if you'll hold on to it for me. I can't get down there for a week. And he said, sure. I didn't even think anybody knew what it was. <laughs> I was like, well, if you're willing, I will pay you full price. And you know, I'll just take it because it was a good price. And um, so I figure it's probably from the 40s, 30s, maybe, given the war effort and aerospace and all that was going on down there. Um, it weighs about 2,500 pounds, super, super solid, stable. Even with a big, heavy mandrel on it, it doesn't move. I've never had it slide across the floor. And just give you a quick... What's the, is it running on 220 or three phase? Yeah, it's three phase. So this mandrel right here is what I do my chef's pans and that's 150 pounds. That's a monster. So, yeah, so that shows you just how stable it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, um, try to do this without getting too much of that pixelation going on. Um, this is a transmission with the direct drive motor. So it's four speeds. And you're using it in the lowest speed setting, correct? No, I'm using it in the fastest speed. The fastest, okay. Yep, yeah. Um, because my stuff is so small. And if you go too slow, um, you don't get a nice flow, at least for the way that I spin, my, my habit is I like to use a faster setting because you can move a little bit quicker and you get a more consistent product for me. So uh, when I bought this guy, yeah. Oh, um, Bill, Billy was wondering like, would you want it to be faster? Would you want another <laughs> quickness setting? I, I don't think so because actually when I'm doing my uh, chef's pans, those bigger bowls, I turn it down a little bit. So I, I slow the speed down a little bit. And what's nice about having a transmission over a VFD, variable frequency drive, is um, you get the full power of the motor all the time. 
you know, when you use a VFD, not only does it slow down the RPMs, it slows down the, uh, the horsepower. What is the horsepower on that motor? I believe it's two and a half. Um, and then I think I know the answer to this, but Rochelle asks, if you have a 150 pound mandrel, why are you storing it above your head? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I use a hoist to put it up there and get it down. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 150 pounds. I can't get it on there. I mean, it's just, it's too heavy for me. I've got other ones that are about that big a diameter, but they're probably only like 50 pounds. And that's about my max. Cause I'm, you know, I'm extended over this, trying to hold it and thread it on, right? Cause this is, um, these are put on with threads. So it's just a eight pitch, one inch thread. Cool. And to line all that up with all that weight is uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, I would imagine if you're not right on, you're really wrestling that thing. And your fingers are in the pinch point. <laughs> That's the other sketchy part. So yeah, I got this lathe. It was plug and play. Uh, there was a little bit of swap to it. So I, you know, being the mechanic head that I am, I took it all apart, kind of cleaned it up, checked all the bearings and all that stuff and put it back together. <laughs> and it came with all the tools. All I had to do was take it home, clean it, put it together, plug it in, and away I went. And it's been a great lathe. I would like to find another one. It's one of the beefiest, this is what they call a uh, 24 inch swing which means it's got 12 inches from the center to the bed. And the, I was talking earlier about raising it up. You can put blocks under here between these two pieces. Oh, cool. And just lift, lift both of them so you can make it bigger. And I've seen, I don't know, there's several other manufacturers on the market, and this is one of the heaviest of this size that I've ever seen. So I got really lucky with it. And it's got a two-speed, well, there's three phases off. It's got a two-speed switch. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, you're a little off camera with the switch. Okay. So it's, it's, uh, it's what they call a 12-winding motor. Mm -hmm. So there's 12 wires that come out of it. So this is the speed I was normally running on. And if I wanted it to go even faster, go down to that guy. And I don't know, it doesn't double it, but it's probably another quarter or another half. So it's, it's a pretty versatile um, setup. So when you were talking about lifting, lifting the motor, um, Billy commented that it looks like you need another swage block. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Br Brian, Brian was wants to know: um, Is there are those roller spindle bearings, or are they run on a Babbitt? Oh, here. I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Let's let's go back. So that's the other thing that's really nice about this. These are um, two huge. They're this big around, and that's what I'm going to replace ball bearings because the pressure on this is this way. And this way, and this one back here is two cone bearings, Timken cone bearings, and they're about that big around. So you use this one to that kind of acts like your thrust bearing, and then this one keeps it in center. Mm -hmm. And this thing's got so many miles on it that the races don't fit in the housing quite right. Like right now, I've got uh, beer can shims in there. And you can probably hear, there's a little bit of slop. And that's what affected that new mandrel I did. <laughs> so I'm gonna be pulling that away apart, getting new bearings and uh, seeing what I can do to, to get this fit better in these bearings. Oh, well, and then I've got a- Take pictures and share, a, them on the, share them on the Facebook. I'm sure we'd all love to see the inside of that thing. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Actually, it's a pretty neat setup. Um, 
The other thing I've got to do, you probably can't see it, but I've got some 16 gauge galvanized steel underneath here, under this one, because this center is lower than this one, just because of all the wear of sliding it back and forth over the years. Uh -huh. So I'm going to see if I can find somebody with a Blanchard cutter big enough to cut this thing parallel again, or, you know, flat all the way across, because that'll make my life so much easier. Cool. So if anybody knows somebody who has a Blanchard grinder cutter that can handle six feet, let me know. <laughs> Yeah, well, we just put it out there into the world and hope for the best. Yeah, exactly. So, do you guys want to see a little bit of the polishing process? Um, I mean, I think I'm I'm game for it. Um, everybody's still in the room. If I'm I'm assuming if folks don't want to see it, they'll just leave. Um, which, okay. Uh, but yeah, Rochelle says sure. I'm saying sure. Um, I would, you know, I would just uh, holler at everybody here because we um, we do have an auction going. I um, just want to remind folks, we're probably going to close that soon. Hunter, Hunter's got one of those bowls at 250. Kurt's got the other one for 200. Kind of um, bid now or hold your peace. And Silas says there's a, Bla a Blanchard grinding outfit on Harbor Island in Seattle. Cool. Okay. I'll have to get in touch with him. If he has the contact, um, send it to me. Because, yeah, I'd, that would be the ideal. Get that Blanchard ground, get those bearing uh, seats, metal sprayed and refinished and line born, board. That would make this thing just like brand new. Um, and then um, Brian says um, Peninsula Iron in Portland. Oh, sweet. Okay. But Sil Silas awesome. can't remember their name of the Seattle one. Oh, Kurt okay. Fisk coming in with 275. And uh, oh, Silas is also bidding at 250. So we got Kurt at one at 275, Silas and Hunter tied at 250. Which one you guys wants it more? Nice. So does that get me two years subscription? <laughs> um, I don't know, man. That's a little greedy. Come no, on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> That was a joke, mostly. <laughs> so let's go into the uh, polishing. So I, again, self-taught, had to be on the phone with uh, reps and whatnot, talking about what I was trying to do. And I was told that getting a bonded wheel like this is a really great way to do your initial cut. So you're not actually polishing, you're cutting away material um, to try to get through that oxide layer. And in the case of this guy, you've got those sanding marks. So you want to take all that away as fast and easily as you can. And the way, the reason these, I think they call them pleated because it's got this wrinkle in it. And what that does is it sucks air through it and uh, keeps it cool. So it's cooling the work as you're uh, providing all that friction, which is heating it. And the bonded ones, it's just got a resin in it. So they're stiffer. And this thing cuts great. And I'm using a white cutting compound. And I don't remember what it is. Um, but it, it's, it's very soft. So you can see it goes away pretty quickly, pretty easily. And um, it just it cuts really nicely. It's super dirty. You can see on the wall, it's all black back there. Um, but here we go. And this is, I believe it's a two horse. Yeah, it's a two horsepower motor, dedicated buffer. So you've got this long arm out here so you can get your parts, big parts in and around there easily. <coughs> so this is my initial cut station. Apply a little bit of the cutter. Hey, Peter, could, could you maybe move the camera about a foot to the left because we are blocking the whole view? Yeah, let's see. I've got some junk on the floor in the way. Let's see how this works. Yeah, I don't think you have to move it much. You're barely in the way. 
Yeah, well, the junk, I was right up against the junk. <laughs> <laughs> True story for a lot of shops, right up against yep. the junk. Yep, right up against the junk. I've totally outgrown this space. So you can see just that little bit that I did really started to put a polish on it. I'll do this. And rather than a lot of this uh, infrequently, it's a little bit a lot. So you want to keep that cutter cutting agent really fresh, and you don't want to get a cake up of uh, residue. You want it to I can't hear that. You want it to do its job without attracting too much of it on the wheel because that cuts its effectiveness. Typically wear gloves when I'm doing this because you just leave fingerprints all over the place. And they're just those real cheap white cotton. not cutting you're just not getting through mm -hmm. just put a little bit more and it works real fast wants to know why you're saying cutting instead of buffing. Um, because as I learned about this stuff, the buffing is actually the final step where you're using a really soft cotton um, unbound. And I'll show that when I get to it. And here I am really cutting this material away. I'm removing a layer to get to the nice virgin copper without scratches in it. Um, and that's, that's just the terminology that the, the polishing people use. One thing also when you're doing this, because I, I sanded it, you've got these rings going this way. And if you're doing the cutting like this, you're following those contours. So you want to go against it. So you go across it, taking the high stuff down. When I was a kid, I used to buff a lot of my uh, uncle's copper. Um, I had no idea how much there was to it. I was just out in the garage with like an old washing machine motor and Tripoli e and spending hours at it, doing it totally wrong. I'm not gonna do a, a total finished job it's probably like watching paint. Well, and, and um, you know, Lisa points out that you would imagine you're wearing a respirator typically right now. Um. Oh, totally. And I, I picked up a thing at an auction a couple months ago, and it's a, a, a room air filter. So it's this two foot by two foot by eight foot contraption hanging on my ceiling, and it's got five micron filter in it is the finished filter and it does a 200 2500 pfm recirculation so it clears the air out in here in about five minutes so i would typically have that running too cool 
Cool. Just to keep the dust down. Yeah. When I saw it at an auction, I was like, hmm, I wonder about that. So I started reading about it. And I was like, oh, man. Lexus shops are filthy. And a lot of it's airborne. So my wife thought it was a really good purchase. So here's sort of the basic, I'll do the bottom shot. So you can see how fast it just takes away those uh, lines. Yeah, it cleans up real quick. Yeah, this is, you know, this stuff was really expensive. I think with, I bought three different wheels and the uh, uh, cut compounds and it was like 250 bucks worth. It wasn't cheap, but it's so worth it. The amount of time that I save is enormous and the quality of the finish is really good. Do those wheels last so a while? The first, um, so far, yeah. Yeah, it's lasted a while. I've done probably 30, 40 pieces on it in the last year. And I don't know how much it shrank, but there's not a lot of fiber around it. There's more just the, the um, cutting compound. So I'm just gonna leave it like that. It's got a little ways to go and head over to the next station. Now, typically you'd want to take a rag, and I will do this, and wipe off all this stuff because you'll infect the other wheels with that, so you won't get a clean. Uh oh, it just mo it'll transfer the cutting compound onto your your buffing wheel. Exactly. Um, uh, I just Bri think Brian asks if you do you like use ever use a lacquer or a clear coat or something on there to keep them shiny, or are they just raw? They're just raw. Um, I used to do that with my uncle's stuff. It stops or slows down the oxidation a little bit. Um, and then you've got to get through that material when you want to polish it back up again. And for like cookware, um, I found that when you're cooking, you know, they get that oxide on them. And some people like it, some people don't. And what I recommend is using Barkeeper's Friend which is just like Bon Ami in one of those shaker bottles. Mm -hmm. So I've just gone through and wiped all the residue off. And after you do your cooking and you wash it, just take a little bit of that uh, Barkeeper's Friend and uh, wash it with that on the outside. That polishes it right back up. So there's kind of how far we got. So now we'll head over to the other. Put that down. You gotta move the camera farther into the junk. Gotta move it further into the junk. And I'm glad it's all terrible quality images I moved because it is totally a mess. <laughs> so you'll trip on this cow when you were here last. I'll show you what I what I've done back here. So this is now my buffing sanding corner. I found a suction system at a junk shop for way cheap. And John Emmerling sold me that guy. And I had it for over a year just sitting out in the shed and finally like nothing to do because we're not going on the road this summer. Like all the little shop projects are getting done. So it's got vacuum, you can see right there, right there. And there's another one back in there. Cool. And, and this guy is on a socket. So I can, oops, what did I just do? I don't know, screen froze though. Yeah, I'm gonna go grab my plug. Are you still there? 
Yeah, we're still here. It's a frozen screen. Okay. Maybe when you get back and plug it in, if you click the stop your video and then restart your video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hang on just well, while Peter's doing this, um, it looks like we've got um, Hunter and Kurt both at uh, 275 for each of those pans. Um, I'm going to call it. this his last call. If it uh, seems like Silas was maybe trying to outbid him. If, if you're out, Silas, I think we got these things sold. Now it says he's out. So um, I'm going to declare this auction over unless somebody speaks up in the next 30 seconds or so. <laughs> well, hopefully I won't bump into this guy. So my video's up, audio's up? Yeah, video's up, audio's up. Um, we just got a message from Bart Turner saying, thank you, Peter, great demo. I think he just left the room. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, so this is the second station, and this is what they call a bonded, no, bound uh, buffing wheel. And it's another form of cutting, but it's a little more consistent and not quite as aggressive. And they bind it so that it doesn't um, blow apart, or not blow apart, but come apart quicker. It makes it last longer. And I use a Tripoli on it, which is another, what they call a cut and color. So it adds a little bit of color to the copper to give it that luxurious, you know, copper color. So here we go. So again, I'm going to work in this way. So I'm going across the sanding to keep that uh, You can just tell by the sound that this isn't as aggressive. Now you're starting to see reflection. Whereas before, it was pretty dull. So I'm just going to do that much on this one. Give you an idea what it does. And then the last one. is this would be the buff. So this would be, um, it's open, unsewn, very soft. Um, and what that does is, you know how you get those lines from the buffer or when you're cutting where it's inconsistent streaks or polish lines, this eliminates those. And then I use a, this is um, a real polish it's kind of a green tint, very, very fine. And this just removes light off. Just grab my rag. Hang on a sec. Um Billy says this is what he uses on his knife handles. Um, and we got Greg leaving the room. He says, great demo. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And Joe, Joe asks if you know of any way of cleaning that buffing wheel when it gets all caked up like that. Yeah, I will show him that here in a second. So I wipe this down. You can see it's got pretty good reflection. And we'll go over this. Oops, don't push too hard. 
Yeah, they have a tool. It's called a rake. And I'll show it to you. It looks like a torture device. A rake? Yep. I've got it up by the um, tuning area. So this one. Oh, um, I would just add, Kurt, Kurt says he's throwing them in the laundry as well. <laughs> oh, man, I, I wouldn't want that in my washing machine. <laughs> Take it to the laundromat. <laughs> and then Joe asked if Kurt's married. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I was going to bring some. Somebody was head broad. Oh, um, Lisa says that she's going to have to get off here soon. But this is so shiny. This whole process seems very soothing and meditative. Um, and that it was great seeing you, Peter, and to see your shop, and that she misses you. Yeah, I miss her too. I miss all you guys. So, so that's, you know, it's, it's kind of rough. This one sticks more because you don't get the heat build up. And the heat, you want a certain level of heat build up in this stuff. But there's, so, so you want it to get hot, you're saying? A little bit, yeah, because that helps with the cutting action and keeping things lubricated and moving. So that's, I'm going to call it good for the, the polishing demo, because anymore I've got to put gloves on and <laughs> do it for real. <laughs> and I've got some grips to fix and stuff like that. Uh -oh. Well, That's Peter, I got to say, this demo, you have gone above and beyond. Um, this is awesome. What a great demo, Thanks. start to finish, and your generosity really has brought in some um, good money for the group today. Uh, we truly appreciate no it. No kidding. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, me too. I've been really happy about that. And it's been my pleasure. Totally enjoyed it. Um, you know, as we all know, it's great to share what you do and what you love to do. Um, Joe's asking if we can see the rack real quick. The rack or the rake? The rake. I guess rake is what he means, but he rake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm making my way back over there. Got you guys. <clears throat> um. Meanwhile, we've got Lee, Peter, or, or Lee, Lee saying, thanks, Peter. Kurt, thanks, Peter. Um, Claire, thank you so much. Um, Bill, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Anton, thanks a lot. It was a fantastic demo. Um, Billy O, thank you, Peter. Very informative, fun to watch. Um, and he had asked this earlier, and I never, I never, re never passed it on to you, but he's wondering if you're looking for an apprentice. <laughs> I think he's really interested. Yeah. Um, not really, but we could talk about it. I'm always, you know, interested. Now um, I'm looking for my rake, and I'm not finding it. Not um, on the shelf where it's supposed to be. Well, while you're looking, um, Patricia also thanks you and is thinking maybe a site visit for a Hot Iron News article is uh, in order soon. Um, totally. Yeah, I'm, we're totally up for that. I've got another one of these demos coming up. There's a guy out here um, who's doing highlights for local um, galleries, some of the nonprofit uh, galleries. So I volunteered to do another one of these demos for them. So this is all good practice. <clears throat> I'm not finding it. I will. Um, well, maybe look for the rack the instead. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking through the rack for the rake. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't know where I put it. Oh, I might have put it over here. Let's try one more thing. Um, I've done a fairly major um, bit of rearranging in this place. So it's not surprising to lose tools that I don't use very often. Um, Joe, Joe's saying, Peter, that was so good. Um, you're a real natural and you make it look easy and fun. 
Don't leave yet, Joe. Here it is. Found it. So that's what a so that's what a rack looks like, huh? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you hang you hang uh, needles and stuff like that in here. It keeps them organized. <laughs> um, so how does that so, work on the buffing wheel? Can you show us real quick? I will. I've got just a small wheel here where this guy was hiding out. So here's your wheel and it's all covered with the wax and, you know, cause it's basically wax with grit suspended in it. Right. And if you get too much on there, it cakes really badly. So while this is spinning, you run this guy into it and it just shreds it. And you can see, I've never used it. I haven't had to use it yet, but I can imagine, you know, they give you two handles. Yeah. I bet you want to hold on. Need it. Yeah. And you know, you don't want to go in like this because it's just going to flip it out of your hand. You know, all wire wheel dangers apply. So you're going to want to come in on the bottom and just shred it off. And it's kind of like combing it really aggressively. There's four rows. Well, um, that is just a gnarly, gnarly thing. <laughs> that is a gnarly thing. Yeah. Um, well, we got any uh, we got any more questions from the participant or the the gallery over here? Anybody? Uh, Joe says thank you so much, Peter, for uh, finding the record. Go. Absolutely. Um, we're slowly kind of losing people. Peter, you got anything you want to add, or should we just call this uh, call this demo a success? Um, just want to thank everybody for being here and, uh, stay healthy and, uh, let's hope to get some other good ones going. Yeah. Um, well, yours is going to be hard to top. This was a great one. I can't wait to get this out hey, on thanks. the uh, YouTube channel. Um, awesome. um, yeah, I'd love so to. Got Rochelle, thank you. Nia. Hunter, thank you. Phil Stringer, thank you. Very inspiring. Patricia, that thank you so much. This was great. Um, and I would just echo all those by what a pleasure. Um, really well thought out. Yeah, demo. You were very prepared. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Good coaching. <laughs> and watching others go ahead of me it gave me all the little bits that I need to figure out. So it was a lot of fun. I totally enjoyed it and uh, glad I raised a nice little bit of money for the organization and uh, hope to see you all soon. We sure did. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone who came to watch today. Um, great kind of, you know, seeing you all as much as we can see each other. We're all just seeing Peter mostly, but um, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to stop recording this thing. Um, thanks all. Thank you all.